The body is that of Kenyan immigrant Leonard Gokinya. He was found hanging from a microwave communications tower on October 2, 2002, in Springfield, Missouri. On the day his body was discovered, authorities ruled his death a clear-cut suicide. Easter Sunday, 1906, three young black men, Horace Duncan, William Allen, and Fred Coker, are lynched by burning in Springfield's town square, just a block and a half away from where Leonard Gokinya's body would hang 96 years later. Springfield was but one of many communities where lynch mobs roamed. They surged through Coatesville, Pennsylvania, Newport, Rhode Island, Duluth, Minnesota, and Valdosta, Georgia, where Mary Turner had her pregnant belly split by a lynch mob member. Her infant uttered a cry before being stomped to death. Mary, too, was lynched. There are a variety of myths associated with the history of lynching. One is that it's a southern phenomenon. In fact, we see that lynching occurred across the nation that it transcends ethnicity, race, and gender. It isn't merely the rabble that perpetuated lynchings. They oftentimes enjoyed broad support within a community. The victims have been African Americans, Mexican Americans, Italians in New Orleans, Pennsylvania, and Colorado, Jews like Leo Frank in 1915, Chinese laborers like Look Young, dragged from Denver's 19th Street by a lynch mob that beat and kicked him to death. They've been union activists, Australians in the Wild West, homosexuals, and this young man, Michael Donald, lynched in 1981 in Mobile, Alabama, or this black man in Omaha, Nebraska in 1919. These two hang from a tree in Marion, Indiana, it was August the 7th, 1930. James Cameron will never forget the day. I was 16 years old. Thomas Ship was 18 and Abram Smith was 19. The mob came into the jail and they got Tommy out first. He was right below me on the first floor. They took him around from this side of the jail to the other side and hung him on the jail windows where Abe was incarcerated. And no doubt Abe was looking at him as they hung him from the windows on the outside of his cell block. Then 15 or 20 minutes later, after celebrating that kill, they came back in, they got Abe out, they beat him to death, drug him past the alley here, and I couldn't see anymore. And then a half a block away, they hung him on the tree. Finally, this guy said, take them all out and lynch him. And when he said that, this 16-year-old boy, Charles Haynes, he raised his hand and said, it wasn't none of us, mister, that's him right there. And he pointed his finger at me like that. And when he did that, the mob closed in on me. And when they got out into the street, the mob hollered, we got him, we got him, we got him. And the police was helping the mob so they could get me up to the tree where Tom and A was hanging with a rope around their neck. Americans have always been fond of their self-determined freedoms. Freedom means free will, but most Americans choose to conform. They have condoned atrocities in the name of that conformity. In 1918, Texas, Tejanos made their living as small ranchers and herders. One cold January night, a 12-year-old boy named Juan Bonilla Flores heard some shots at 2 in the morning. He's now 97. Como a las 2 de la mañana, dijeron, se oyó unos tiros para allá, falta que los hayan matado. Dijeron, no, pero ¿por qué? ¿Por qué los van a matar? Y no debemos nada. Ellos mismos vienen aquí todo el tiempo. That night, Juan's father, Longino, was one of 15 men and teenagers rounded up by local white ranchers and Texas rangers before being marched through the Texas desert and massacred for being successful and Mexican. No había quien lo mandara allí, uno trabajaba por sí. Y nomás 
se acabó y su posibilidad sea muy a raíz a uno después, muy triste todo, que de repente teníamos mucho de qué vivir y de repente nada, hasta la fecha está no ahí. 85 years later, Mr. Flores still has nightmares. He would either have them in the daytime or nighttime. It didn't matter what time it was. But he would tell us to wake him up because he was hollering, screaming, and sometimes he would be mumbling things that we wouldn't understand what was going on. Only, only he knew what was going on. Los dejaron sin cabeza todos hechos garra. Todos hechos garra no se conocía. As the 20th century dawned, many Americans not only failed to condemn the pervasive practice of lynching, they often condoned it. Southern trees bear a strange fruit, blood on the leaves. Some lynchings were festive affairs. Newspaper ads would attract large crowds requiring the booking of extra excursion cars on trains. Law enforcement turned a blind eye. What was it like to participate? In a lynching, no matter how big a crowd it is, only about 25 or 30 people do all the participatory work. The rest of them are just standing there looking. Onlookers, spectators. They could have stopped that mob that night. They could have said, hey, we don't want this to happen in our city. We're not going to stand for it. But no, they stood there and silently they gave consent. What kind of people make up a lynch mob? Ordinary people, your neighbors, people you wouldn't think. Good people, bad people, angry people, loving people, church-going people. All of them get caught up in that mob hysteria. What was it like to witness a lynching if the victim was someone you knew and loved? Pat Ratliff was just nine years old when he witnessed the mob hanging of his bank robber father, Marshall Ratliff, in Cisco, Texas in 1929. You couldn't tuck a hog and slaughtered him, and he'd look no different and worse than what they did to my dad, you know. It's never been told the whole truth. I don't care who it affects and who it hurts. I've seen those people when the Texas Bankers Association fed them whiskey all day long, and then that night they pitched them the keys and turned them loose, and they went in and got him and brought him out naked. And after they, they hung him, well, that's the last time I'd seen him. In 1901, Mark Twain became outraged at a lynching that had happened in his home state of Missouri. Incensed, he wrote his famous essay called The United States of Lyncherdom. Picture the scene in your mind and soberly ponder it. Then multiply it by 115. Add 88. Place the 203 in a row, allowing 600 feet of space for each human torch so that there may be viewing room around it for 5,000 Christian American men, women, and children. For the rain together, for the wind to suck. Make it night for grim effect. Have the show in a gradually rising plane and let the course of the stakes be uphill. The eye can then take in the whole line of 24 miles of blood and flesh bonfires unbroken. And Mark Twain's pleas were largely ignored. 